My name is Teresa Vaughn, and I am an Advanced Care Planning Consultant for Sharp Healthcare. Today, I will be talking with you about Advanced Care Planning. So what is Advanced Care Planning? We see Advanced Care Planning as a gift to your loved ones. It allows your loved ones to make difficult decisions on your behalf if ever there's a time you can't speak for yourself. It relieves the emotional burden of them having to make a decision on your behalf. So why is advanced care planning important? Because it puts you in the driver's seat of your healthcare journey. With this plan in place, it helps others speak on your behalf and say what you would have wanted to say. We never want to think about the what ifs, but there are times when we need to have this discussion. And we create this important tool that your loved ones can use down the road. It's also important because it helps protect against the, those backseat drivers. Does anyone know any backseat drivers? Completing an advanced healthcare directive allows you to put your wishes in order, your healthcare wishes in order. What are some benefits to advanced care planning? Well, a person's voice can be heard even if they can't speak for themselves. Their family or healthcare agent can be relieved of the moral guilt of having to make a decision for them. Instead, they'll just be speaking what the person have already said they want. A person's wishes and preferences can align with the treatment that they actually receive. And a reliable document can be stored and retrieved when necessary. So why are people hesitant to begin this process? Well, there are many reasons. Oftentimes people say, oh, I'm not that sick. Oh, it's too confusing. Oh, I've already talked to my lawyer. Oh, nothing won't happen to me. It might be bad luck. Or they may say, I'm sure that my loved ones already know what I want. They may even think, I don't wanna talk about my mortality or I don't like difficult conversations. And some people are just plain old procrastinators such as myself. But some things we wanna consider when we're completing our advanced healthcare directive are aging considerations. What would I want as I age? What would my loved ones need to provide for me and speak on my behalf as I age? What if I have dementia or some other cognitive decline? What if there's a chronic illness such as congestive heart failure, diabetes, cancer, COPD? Or what if there's a functional decline? If I have, can no longer walk, can no longer use my hands. Some other considerations might be a car accident, something tragic, a sudden illness that no one's thinking about, like a pandemic. We never saw that coming. One thing that happened during a pandemic, some hospitals had to consider a universal do not resuscitate order. What would you have wanted during this time? Have that conversation with your loved ones. So you want to choose a healthcare agent very carefully. And this person should know what's most important to you, what your goals, values, and beliefs are, where you desire to live or die, when medical decisions should be continued or discontinued, and what resources are available to you, such as a long-term care insurance policy or any veteran benefits. And the person you select should be someone you can talk to, to discuss your goals and values with. If someone doesn't want to talk about these things, you may not want to select them. This person should be willing to accept the responsibility. So you want to ask them first. They should be able to follow your wishes and they're able to make decisions in stressful situations. So there are many healthcare directives out there. There's nothing magical about any document, but you do want to pay close attention to the witnessing requirements. And in the state of California, the requirements are two witnesses or a notary. And you have to sign that document in front of either the two witnesses or the notary. We always recommend that you color outside the line. So you don't necessarily have to just say whatever's on the form, but you can add extra things, whatever is important to you. And we recommend using a wallet card. You can review and update your plan. We say every six Ds. If there's 
every decade or so, every 10 years or so, you want to maybe review that document. We say pull it out, blow the dust off, and see if it still honors your goals and your wishes. If there's a death, you want to review your document because it's pretty hard for a person to speak on your behalf if they're no longer living. If there's a divorce, you want to review your document and maybe update it. If there is a new diagnosis, just pull that document out to see if that document still honors what you would want. If there is a pandemic, we didn't see this coronavirus coming our way, but you wanna have that conversation, what would I want in this season of life? Or if there is a decline, if there is a decline, you want to have a conversation to see if your goals and wishes still are reflected in your advanced healthcare directive. But as long as you have decisional capacity, you can change your advanced healthcare directive at any time. And as long as you have decisional capacity, the healthcare team will come directly to you to ask you what you would want. This document only comes into play when you can no longer speak for yourself. And if you have a more serious illness, you wanna consider a more detailed document that will explain how your disease will likely progress. So have a conversation with your physicians early so you can document that. Have you ever heard of the POST? The POST is a supplementary document that comes alongside the Advanced Healthcare Directive. And it stands for the Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It is a medical order. It's a pink document that's portable. It transfers from one location to another. So if a person's at a hospital and they go to a skilled nursing facility and back to home, it transfers with them. It's recognized throughout the state of California. Not everyone would fill out a post. The post is typically filled out by someone with a chronic, progressive, or serious illness, maybe someone who's medically frail, or someone who just does not want an attempt at resuscitation. So there are many parts to the POST document. Part A stipulates, if I no longer have a POST and I'm not breathing, which means the person has passed away because we don't know anyone walking around without a POST and not breathing. We're not talking about our zombie movies, of course. But if we don't have a POST and we're not breathing, that means we've passed a natural death. Would you want an attempt at resuscitation? And in the resuscitation process, we have to exert 100 to 125 pounds of pressure to the chest to get about two inches deep to get the good old heart going again. And remember, the person who fills out a pulse is someone who's chronically ill, medically frail. So that person may or may not want that attempt, may not want that amount of pressure to their chest. So then they could say, yes, I want an attempt at resuscitation, or no, I do not want an attempt at resuscitation. There are many applications to Part A, is only when a person has no heartbeat and they're not breathing. It doesn't mean do not do anything. We will do something if you do have a pulse and you're breathing or breathing, well then we'll get to that in Part B. But we have careful communication when we're completing this document. So that's why it is a physician's order to be discussed with your physician. We talk about the success rate of CPR because many people think that it looks like it does on the television, when actually it does not. So we say, what does CPR look like in real time? What's the success rate in real time? And then part B of that document says, let's say I come in and I have a pulse or I'm breathing, but I'm non-responsive. What type of medical intervention would I want? Would I want what we call aggressive full treatment, meaning I want to be intubated, ventilated, and placed in the ICU in the hospital. And then you can select maybe just a trial period of that. Or would I want just a selective treatment or a comfort-focused treatment? And Part C of that document addresses artificial nutrition and artificial hydration. Then this document is signed by the physician and the patient or the medical decision maker. It can be updated at any time. Do you know the difference between palliative care and hospice? 
Well, palliative care is comfort care provided during any phase of a disease process. Any phase, a year out, two years out, five years out, you can receive palliative care to manage symptoms for chronic illness. Hospice care is palliative care also, which is comfort care, but it's provided when the prognosis is six months or less, and it's also to manage symptoms. You typically tend to have a more robust team with the hospice benefit. So it looks a little bit like this. If a person is diagnosed with a chronic illness, they receive more curative care and less palliative care. And then as they go along the trajectory of the disease process, they receive a little bit more palliative care, less curative care. And when they have a prognosis of six months or less, then they're offered the hospice benefit. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.